very good afternoon to all of you on behalf of sri lanka medical association i would like to i would like to welcome all of you for this very important session uh, that is uh, our first slma 133rd anniversary pre conference workshop uh, we are basically uh, kick starting the annual academic sessions the international anniversary conference of slma with today's uh, historic pre conference workshop and this is a very important pre conference workshop for us due to many reasons the first reason is we are celebrating 150 years of medical education in sri lanka during this year and right now we are going through a crucial time period globally as well as nationally therefore lot of changes in medical education are called for and we are moving into the new norm so today during this very important dean's round table we'll be discussing the new norm situation and then planning out how the medical education will be moving towards the new norm and also the current challenges that we are facing related to the medical education such as the world federation of medical education decision regarding accreditation of medical schools so today we'll be discussing all these areas and i would like to invite my co-host and the co-moderator dr sajid to welcome the panel and give an introduction about today's discussion or to sajid thank you sir uh, today we will be talking mainly about the future of the medical education adapting to new normal situations uh, so in this panel we have uh, all the deans of the medical faculties the state medical faculties so we warmly welcome all the deans of the medical faculties by individually we will introduce and describe the each and every uh, dean who has participated for the webinar when we are giving the chance for the speak, uh, speaking time and uh, the important thing is and we will also welcome all the uh, participants who are, who have jo joined us with online uh, for this first pre congress workshop the dean's round table so to in order to start the webinar uh, indika uh, professor indika uh, i would like to in, uh, introduce uh, give the opportunity for you to start the webinar Uh, by introducing our first speaker yes uh, so as i have mentioned previously this is a very historic event getting all the deans in sri lanka together into one virtual platform which we call the deans round table so this is going to be a historic meeting with lot of important areas discussed and uh, our first speaker is professor wajir h w disanayaka who is a newly elected dean of the faculty of medicine kalambo and uh, uh, he has more special reasons uh, to be a resource person for this uh, historic webinar and the pre conference workshop because he has special interest about the it and the medical informatics and it and medical informatics would be very important uh, when we are moving towards a new norm further he is a past president of sri lanka medical association as well over to you professor ajit sanayaka president of the sri lanka medical association Uh, Professor Indika Karnatilaka, uh, Co-Chair Dr. Sajid Edir Singha, uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting uh, me as well as all the other deans uh, to take part in this, uh, uh, as you correctly said, uh, the historic webinar uh, bringing together all deans of uh, medical faculties in the country. I don't think uh, we've uh, had an uh, event like this in the entire history of the Sri Lanka Medical Association. So I would like to begin by congratulating you uh, for taking the initiative and uh, the council uh, for the excellent arrangements that you've uh, put together. As we all know, uh, COVID. has um, been a challenge as well as an unprecedented opportunity it has created uh, or it has challenged us to think differently 
to work differently and also to uh, reflect on what we are doing um, in a way which has in a way which we uh, all of us have never been challenged before so the um, the um, special thing that i've always seen in the covid epidemic is the fact that as the medical profession we have had to go back and uh, look at the basics basics of public health and uh, it is that strong basics that have uh, uh, on which sri lanka's uh, health system uh, is built that has enabled us to face uh, the covid epidemic and not be if i were to use the word affected uh, to the scale at which even some of the more affluent countries in the world were affected at the same time uh, we also have to be cognizant of the fact that if we did not have that strong public health base and if it was a different scenario um, of rampant covid in covid in the country whether we could have actually dealt with that situation and uh, so in that context we really need to look at okay what are we doing how would we have responded differently today's discussion obviously is uh, centering around uh, medical education and uh, as uh, as um, a medical faculty um, and as a you know as a newly elected dean of a medical faculty um, i have had to re reflect on uh, how we respond to this when we are confronted with a challenge like this the first and the most paramount um, important thing is um, is the consideration i would say is the safety of everyone the staff the students those who seek our services of a faculty in another way and so on so the in that context what we found was that although we had a centrally given response to how we deal with the security aspects the safety aspects there was also the need for everyone to identify what their roles were and then to play that role so as a faculty we uh, focused on that so while we were focusing on the bigger picture of what our response was going to be we were also focusing on identifying what the role of the individual was and how to ensure that that prince central guidance was broad enough uh, to enable each individual to play their role and then there was specific guidance uh, that enabled that however as you know uh, one of the biggest challenges that we face in our country is uh, when we implement certain steps to ensure that there is proper monitoring and evaluation and follow up and that is the phase that we are now moving into and we are hoping that 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 we would uh, be able to um, ensure that the response that we mounted does not fade away and that it would continue to uh, be strengthened monitored evaluated and uh, taken forward 
and that the new norm in our faculty, in the way we respond, uh, we function, is not going to be just going back to where we were before all this happened. Moving on to the functioning of the faculty as well as the medical education aspects. Uh, it is very clear that the way forward is through digitalization. So the immediate, the reactionary response uh, to the crisis was how do you or how do we get our teaching learning activities moved on to a digital platform. I think fortunately the uh, guidance coming from the UGC, the immediate availability of Zoom um, and the likes and the fact that in the University of Colombo, we had a strong network operating center, which supported us, enabled us to migrate from the traditional way to the online learning platform very quickly. And if you look at the statistics uh, that's been coming out from the UGC, I think uh, the University of Colombo as a whole has made that transition uh, very well. However, digital transformation is not just moving on from the paper way of doing things to just taking that same content into an online platform. So as I said, the reaction was we took our traditional teaching on to the online platform. And what I have seen over the past few weeks and months, because we've been doing this for the past two months at least now or more, it's evolving. It's evolving and becoming better. And as both the staff and the students become familiar with the technology, we are making the technology transfer um, seamlessly and more and more people are becoming comfortable with uh, the online way of uh, teaching and learning. However, just still focusing my discussion on uh, teaching and learning, we haven't been able I, to make that transition uh, beyond teaching and learning to evaluation. So to enable evaluation also to happen in an online world, we need further refinement of our systems. And I guess to getting onto a fully fledged online platform to enable education, that is the next frontier that we need to um, deal with. And uh, we are the, starting the discussions, hopefully in the next coming weeks and months on how we make that transition. However, now I do not think as a you know, faculty, uh, we can just focus on only the teaching and learning. There is an entire way of functioning of a medical school. So to enable that, what we did in the Colombo Medical Faculty was we brought in all the groups that were involved in some form of contribution to our learning, um, teaching learning environment as well as beyond. So again, expanding that teaching learning environment a little bit, uh, we realized that we need to bring in the library. We need to bring in 
our so-called computer-assisted learning labs or virtual environment, as we were calling it. Then we had simulation labs. Then we have our audiovisual units and so on. So we, need to, we needed to expand who the stakeholders were beyond the managers of the learning management system. So that now we could deploy these other assets, if you want to call it, to support the lecturers, the professors, and the senior professors and senior lecturers and so on to create content that was going to be suitable to be deployed on an online platform. So that is what we are doing now. Uh, we have set up a group which we have titled as a Center for Digital Transformation, which is looking at this thing, this entire effort holistically. Going beyond that boundary also, we realize that we need to bring in also the administrative structures onto the online platform. So how do we transform the administration? How do you transform financial and financial management? How do you transform grant management? How do you, um, you know, transform other aspects of running the faculty? So that entire process needs to be done. And we are, we've now developed a plan which is enabling us to do it. We did a quick development of that plan during the past uh, one, week, um, one week. And now we are ready to deploy it in a complete uh, holistic manner. Now, once you have that plan, we also need to realize that there are uh, two or three other aspects that we need to look into. One is the um, human resources. So we need to um, take stock of our human resources and look at how we upgrade the skills of those human resources um, uh, to um, you know, enable what we want to do. So that is another aspect that we are looking at. What is the training that is required at all levels of staff? How do we get our non-academic staff also engaged in this effort? What is the training required for them and so on? The second thing that we need to look at is the material or the resources. So we are looking at everything from IT resources, the uh, in terms of computer hardware, network connectivity, connectivity for our students, the connectivity for our staff, then the fact that a simple thing, for example, a staff member uh, in the non academic staff has to be allowed to take a computer, laptop, computer home and operate from home, this kind of aspects of the resource management. And then finally, we also have to look at what are the financial um, resources that are required to enable this whole thing? What are the finances required to enable this whole thing? So we are in the process of um, getting that also sorted out so that we will go forward. Then the next aspect is who are the partners that we need in this process? We need technology partners. So we have now talk, started talking to uh, the technology providers uh, out there who can help with the infrastructure as well as with the connectivity. We also need to engage with other partners who will be able to enable us to transform the way we develop content for a digital world. We've started engaging them as well. So like this, we are looking at a complete holistic transformation of what we are doing in the faculty. And um, since we are part of a national system of medical faculties, we have um, almost a dozen of them now, uh, we'll be happy to share what we developed here with everybody. 
as well as we'll be happy to learn from uh, what others are doing. So my final um, few words is that we are all in this together. We have to respond to this together and overcome the challenges together. And I look forward to uh, working with all of you, uh, myself as uh, the Dean, and I'm sure all my faculty and the faculty look forward to working with all of you uh, to respond to this challenge. And it would be a pleasure for us to share our learnings and whatever we develop here with all of you freely, as well as learn from you and uh, try to see how we can adopt your best practices uh, to improve what we are doing here as well. So with those words, thank you very much. And I'll hand back to the chair. Thank you, Professor Ajiradi Sanayaka. You have provided a very uh, elaborate overview about a master plan regarding how we can move forward. Before we move into the next speaker, uh, can I ask one question from you? Now, uh, when you think about medical education, a key component is clinical training. Now, uh, most faculty have started the theoretical teaching and even the group discussions. But the key component of clinical teaching and then uh, the practical and maybe community teaching, what are the plans that you have in mind using the new technology without minimizing the, the current advantages that we have, that is basically the, the patient base that we have and the clinical material. So how can we move forward related to clinical teaching? How can we move into the new norm without compromising the clinical training of our students? Yes, I think uh, you brought up a very important um, aspect. I think uh, the strength of uh, the training that we provide in all our faculties is uh, the fact that there is hands-on uh, hands um, uh, training and the clinical material that is available in our wards and how people respond. I mean, the fact that we, our students have free access to this material. So the, I think the key issue here is how do you avoid, avoid overcrowding in wards? How do you avoid overcrowding during a clinical teaching session? And so on. So the clinical departments in our faculty have been addressing this issue. And they have come up with innovative plans of how they are going to do it. So the key lies in the fact that uh, the, the big ward classes, as it were, is not going to be the new norm. It's going to be small groups um, working with individual clinicians um, to not to come um, so that the hands on clinical exposure is not compromised. But using technology to, um, uh, using technology to, um, uh, you know, bring on the bigger learning experience, the traditional classes as, we, as it were, and so on. And also that gives uh, you an opportunity uh, when you go, um, so that the bigger uh, teaching to happen using virtual uh, platforms, online platforms. And that gives you uh, opportunity also because it is just not only that patient that you would be examining in a traditional class who is presented, but you may, you may have other material which you can bring in to a ward discussion class uh, online. And that could include, for example, small videos that are relevant uh, to a, te a teaching learning session um, and other material of that nature. So uh, that is why I said, we have to look at this thing holistically because if our digital transformation is just giving connectivity, just 
you know without face to face interaction just giving uh, you know online connectivity between a and b that is not a complete transformation the transformation has to involve bringing in uh, creating the platform to bring in other material uh, that would be useful and are relevant to a particular teaching learning activity so that is what we are looking at how do you make that transition so that everything is provided in this platform and it becomes a kind of a enhanced experience um it has virtual reality coming in it has interactive videos coming in it has it may even have interactive uh, question and answer sessions coming in and so on so we need to ensure that that entire transformation has happened and that is what we are looking at thank you professor ajira maybe perhaps there are maybe blessings in disguise and perhaps we can include improve, improve the student engagement and maybe making the clinical teaching sessions more engaging and interactive using the current opportunities that we have and uh, next we'll move to the next speaker i would like to invite dr sajith my co host to invite the next speaker right uh, thank you sir uh, our next speaker will be professor surangi asavardhana Dean, Faculty of Medical Sciences, University of Australia, Jawaharlal. Uh, over to you, Madam. Thank you, Sajid, and also thank you very much, uh, Indika, for giving this opportunity and a very timely topic where we should all the deans and everybody should be discussing. So uh, I think uh, the background was very well given by the uh, former speaker, Professor Vajira Disanayake. So I will proceed from that point. i think the main challenge for us as deans is already the medical course is a quite a long course so with the previous uh, one or two years uh, like uh, we all know with the uh, strikes and things it has now a time that the student spends in the faculty is about 6 years so we our main objective should be to somehow with this covid Uh, the problems coming on somehow reduce the uh, whatever the rest of the i mean the we have to catch up the time that we have lost on this uh, due to the covid situation so in that regard i think uh, in the all the medical faculties i am aware that uh, as professor vajira very correctly uh, yeah, explained we have been going on to the web based platform and lot of online uh, teaching Uh, theory uh, teaching has been done so with that i think uh, little later we went we had this problem we had to uh, we thought of that somehow uh, only the theory teaching would not be sufficient so we have to reduce our whatever the time uh, on uh, practicals and other uh, clinical teaching so with that uh, idea i think uh, uh, we in fact uh, we went on to the stage where certain practicals were like uh, the actual sessions were videoed or like uh, we had the real met- the method how to do a practical where and that was uploaded to the uh, lma so that was initially delivered to the students so our idea was that the students are well aware about the Uh, how to conduct a practical if i take my uh, discipline anatomy where in fact we went to the extent of showing them the dissections where we did the dissections and what are the structures they have to identify so that when they are brought to the uh, dissecting room a uh, le- little later they are well aware what they have to do so that the practical we, we can really catch up on time so that It was one uh, thing that we really, the staff uh, worked during these uh, days, and that is happening at present. So the practicals, what we are going to do in future is to actually uh, combine. Maybe we are in e- previously we had the one or two practical sessions will be combined, and the students when they return to the faculty, they will uh, do the practical in in much in a lesser time period in 
so that we can reduce the time that they spend in the faculty because as we all are aware the main uh, issue the challenge that we have is that with our hostel facilities and the facilities available in the university even after uh, say uh, the, the situation in the country improves when they return to the faculty we have to reduce their stay in the faculty so with that sense we have been doing going into the extent of even doing the practicals showing the practicals to the students the same thing would apply if i am to answer the question that uh, professor indika raised previously now once the hospitals open up and when they, the students are there to do their clinicals i think the situation will be quite different it will not be the same uh, situation whereas the medical student should walk in put walk into the hospital wards or the professorial uh, units at any time and approach any patient and uh, ask we are say get the history and examine so with that i think we have to adapt during this days with the best teaching maybe that we can like even uh, the uh, patient and uh, we can get a demonstrator or another one student to question the patient and that could be through zoom or give the students to like they can again ask questions uh, seeing the uh, patient and uh, uh, something like that where we do even the clinical teaching is been done that is i think happening in professorial units at the moment so that uh, uh, they can they are although they are at home the students although they cannot come to the hospital and take a history they are given a small group they are given chance to uh, like uh, say uh, follow the history taking or the examination and even uh, ask a question from the patient so that chance is given so that sort of uh, techniques i think we will have to adapt uh, to uh, to so that we the students at the moment they have some clinical uh, exposure so that we have to maintain that uh, is one thing and the next is actually during this period what we have adapted in the faculty is something that the students have to be in their good mental frame so the mindfulness program that has been running in the faculty where a lot of student participation so that they are in good uh, mental frame so with all this uh, the where the country is having this uh, uh, troublesome situation so with that that is also happening so uh, like uh, very uh, i mean again the uh, professor vajira very correctly said that uh, what up to now what we have not been doing through web based is actually we have not done the assessment that is also uh, some sort of uh, formative assessments like the assignments where they have been given the through the lms they have been given the chance the questions tutorial questions where they answer and submit that is also happening but the real the formative uh, i would say the summative uh, uh, assignments up to now we have not done so as we all know the next monday we'll be doing we're having the final mbbs examination so that is being planned Uh, i think that is what has been happening at the moment in the faculty and very correctly this has been a new experience to both the teachers as well as to the students and i'm happy to say the students are very very happy in this setup and they are i mean they have very easily more than the teachers very easily the students have adapted with the new web based teaching and the where the uh, teachers are also doing that thank you indika thank you uh, uh, professor rangi i would like to ask a different question from you because uh, i think you are the uh, senior most of the long standing dean in the medical council uh, during last so many years uh, as you are well aware there was a decision from the world federation of medical education uh, regarding accreditation and if the medical school accreditation in sri lanka if it is not in uh, in confirmation with the world federation of medical education there is a risk that uh, uh, we might be uh, losing the the current situation or the current recognition with the ecfmg and probably the world federation and that is not 
applicable only to Sri Lanka, but worldwide as well. And recently, the considering the current COVID situation, the WFME has relaxed the deadline on uh, 2023. And the current situation, Sri Lanka, the minimum standards medical education is yet to be approved by the parliament. And that would have a lot of implications in medical education and the standards as well. So what is your opinion? How can we get the minimum standards in medical education, probably an accreditation system? What's your vision and thinking regarding that? Uh, actually, with regard to the minimum standards, I think uh, the minimum standards are very... Uh, a good document has been prepared with the participation of all the medical faculties. In fact, the minimal standards document was sent to all the medical faculties. It was discussed in all the faculty boards and with all that, that was handed over to the Minister of Health, to the uh, Sri Lanka Medical Council. And as very correctly you mentioned that uh, it is, it has been uh, actually uh, Take a bit. the gazette is prepared, uh, but the thing is, it has not been discussed at the parliament. So the the, the thing is, uh, it need to be somehow. I think as uh, deans and as from the Sri Lanka Medical Association, and I think even the everybody, uh, uh, all the medical educationists, uh, we should be uh, pressing the health minister somehow to. Uh, take uh, to uh, take this to the parliament, and where uh, I think this need to be uh, uh, discussed at the parliament, so that it becomes a uh, it is gazetted. The thing is, the parliament first of all, I think the parliament should be functioning. So the next is the, the other the major issue. Now that anyway, the minimum standards, all of us have agreed on the minimum standards. So now uh, the next is, as you said, about the WFME and the recognition. So here, the uh, medical course, the, it's a professional course. And at the UGC, we do have the quality assurance and uh, quality assurance unit where all our medical programs have been assessed. But that is different. Since this is a professional course, I think the professional uh, accreditation should come from the Sri Lanka Medical Council. So this has been discussed at the Medical Council. And in fact, we have was a small subcommittee appointed and we, to, uh, we have gone into that. And now I think uh, we should be uh, uh, applying to the, I mean, passing this to the, uh, the World Federation so that uh, we somehow we should get the Sri Lanka Medical Council as the professional body. Whereas then the next is the medical council will have to uh, go through the medical programs in the country and uh, do the accreditation. And because uh, uh, I think uh, Professor Indika is well aware that uh, we have to have this uh, one round of accreditation should go so that the WFME will uh, uh, take us seriously. And I think they would, uh, uh, like recognize medical council as a as an accreditation body. I think that is very very important. We all should realize the importance of that and somehow uh, go through this cycle quite early. Uh, thank you, Professor Angi. Actually, there was uh, uh, the meeting regarding this accreditation during last year, 2019, before the COVID came in. And uh, they are the ECFMG and the WFME, they have expressed their willingness to work with Sri Lanka. So this could be one very important topic that all the deans should take note of and work together because we need to establish an accreditation system. And, uh, thank you so much. And we'll be moving to the next resource person, uh, Professor Prasanta Vijay Singh, again, a very experienced academic and a clinician and has a lot of experience in working the PGIM as well. Professor Prasanthe, it's all to you. Thank you, Indika, for allowing me this opportunity. <clears throat> Historically, uh, during my professional life, which spans over more than four decades now, words like uh, distance learning mode, LMS, computer-assisted learning, these were uh, being discussed over the last several decades. But how much of that was uh, incorporated in our uh, teaching learning culture was 
at best sporadic. So that was the past. So as Indika mentioned a while ago, that the COVID-19 is a blessing in disguise. Now the time has come and all of us have to uh, uh, latch on to this uh, mode of teaching learning, which is one of the few that is available uh, because of this uh, pandemic. And of course, I see few uh, challenges with regard to that. There is a need to empower the teachers because not all teachers are conversant with the technology. They may not be conversant with the possible teaching learning tools that can be used in this uh, endeavor. Then of course the students, now I get uh, reports from uh, some students, some, some students are lacking basic facilities like electricity, internet coverage, the proper bandwidth. Some people don't have the equipment necessary, so on and so forth. And of course the environment, the administrators, the, 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 the computer centers, the, uh, the other people who are supporting this activity, even the mindset among some of these people will have to be um, adjusted to this new situation. The challenges that I see uh, for the future is probably the knowledge aspect, you know, probably we, we can uh, impart knowledge through this uh, distant learning mode fairly effectively. But when it comes to uh, developing skills, be it uh, skills that has to be developed in a laboratory, maybe in the community or maybe in the clinical setting, that probably will be a, a bigger challenge. So obviously there is innovation that is required in order to uh, use different techniques to impart uh, skills on our graduates. And of course, uh, another aspect is uh, the attitude and the mindset uh, of graduates. So something that uh, we, we will have to think about if we were to uh, live with this new challenge where uh, distant learning, distance learning mode will become a way of life for all the stakeholders. So that is my small uh, uh, message to everybody who is joining. Thank you very much for giving that opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Prasant. And uh, with your long-standing administrative experience, you have highlighted the, the need to be practical and to think about the available resources and what are the challenges that we have. And uh, because for the interest of the time, we'll move to the next presenter. Again, Dr. Sajit. Thank you, sir. The next presenter is uh, Professor Asiri Abegunavardhana, Dean, Faculty of Medi Medicine, University of Peradhani. Over to you, sir. Right. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Indika and Sajid. Uh, actually, this is a very timely discussion because I think the medical education is really facing a major challenge. On one side, we have been asked to increase the intake. And at the same time, now we are facing this challenge of COVID. As well as at the same time, uh, there are other constraints, physical constraints as well as clinical materials in medical education that probably needs to be addressed. In a medical faculty, we need to impart knowledge to candidates, the, the students. At the same time, we need to equip them with certain skills, as well as we need to conduct assessments to make sure that we have done our job. Now, imparting knowledge can be done with lectures, small group discussions, dissections, and practicals. Now, all these things is not going to be a major challenge in spite of the COVID epidemic or uh, with constraints of other things because the online platforms has really worked very well. So I don't think we will have a major challenge in that, but the major problem will lie with the clinical training and clinical examinations. So the clinical training in our medical faculties usually commence from third year onwards and spans over three years or so. And most of our clinical training is counted in weeks. Now, even the medical minimum standard documents, we have counted things in weeks. 
Now, what we are actually doing in medical faculties is forced teaching. I mean, we say, okay, you have to go for two weeks appointment for ENT, I, etc. Whether we are actually getting what we need for medical education is something highly questionable because we are actually using less than 25% of the total capacity of teaching clinical training facilities because we are using only the main big teaching hospitals. Now, if you look at very uh, advanced medical faculties like Cambridge University or Yale University, now there they provide you a task. So for example, you have to go and follow up a mother who comes with a pregnancy until the delivery and for the first two weeks afterwards. So that student will go any, I mean, they have this designated areas, the hospitals to go, so they can just simply go and follow it up and the task is done. But in our setup, sometimes they do about clock about 25 patients, with, but they never follow up from A to Z. So, <clears throat> so we will have to learn new methods. So by using the required skills, how to equip them by sending them to various places. So they can effectively do in their local uh, hospitals some, some clinical skills can be obtained. I mean, surgery can be learned even at a base hospital surgeon. So if we sort of effectively uh, communicate with these clinicians in and around your area and utilize them to the maximum, then we should be able to overcome this. So, but we will have to think innovatively and reform our uh, clinical training program entirely. In addition, the conduct of examinations. Now we are actually faced with that today uh, when we are conducting the final examination. Now, even without the COVID epidemic, the number of cases available for or to conduct examination is fast declining. And we are struggling with the numbers today. So we need to think of using simulated patients and also assessing real skills by using the now finding clinical signs is only one aspect of clinical examination, but there is an approach, the, the technique, the communication, all that. So we may have to sort of think differently. So these are the challenges that we are facing today, and I'm sure we have solutions for that. So it's very good that you had this uh, webinar with all the deans uh, uh, on the platform so that it has opened up a discussion so that we can take it forward because if you don't do that, it will be a very difficult task for us because as Professor Surangi mentioned, our course is really packed with material uh, and because of these uh, interruptions, it has got extended beyond six years. So we need to cut it down to five years because holding six bachelors in medical faculty is always a burden to any medical faculty. So we have to sort of see that we some other get back to five years and that five years too, in all our uh, assessments that we have done, the students are highly stressed. And so many students have gone for treatment for depression and stress-related disorders and I do know sometimes they even uh, attempt to commit suicide as well. So we have to look at that side as well. And as Surangi said, uh, the, the students are really enjoying the online teaching program. So because they are of different timeline, we are different timeline. So they are more familiar with the digital uh, learning and digital uh, uh, technology. And I think we need to cater for that. So this is a COVID thing came as a blessing in disguise for medical education in Sri Lanka. Thank you very much, Indika and Sajid.
Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, before moving on to the next uh, speaker, I just want to ask a small question from you, sir. Uh, so, according to your view, what could be the percentage like uh, the lectures? How much of percentage that we can deliver online? I know that all the lectures cannot be delivered online. So, right. according to your view, what could be the percentage like? At least fifty percent could be delivered online. Uh, maybe even more. But certainly, certain interactions are necessary through uh, uh, live lectures as well, uh, because then there is some sort of uh, uh, interaction between the lecturer and the students. So certain things you really need to have a uh, live platform, but most of the things, the knowledge can be easily delivered uh, through online lectures. Right. Thank you, sir. To introduce the next speaker, I would like to hand over to Professor Indika. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Sajit. Uh, before moving, maybe if I may ask one more question from Professor Asiri, uh, the Dean Faculty of Medicine, Peradhani, because uh, Peradhani, as you know, has been a pioneer in medical education since Professor Seneca Bibi's time, and a lot of innovations in medical education started there. So, what do you think about making this as an opportunity uh, to introduce new innovations in medical education? probably with the support of the medical education unit at Peradeniya. I think the medical education unit uh, has been leading our uh, online teaching program and I'm very proud to say that it has been a great success. And it was a privilege to have that uh, unit in our faculty and uh, uh, especially Professor Kosala Marande and uh, uh, Dr. Sira Dharmaratna has been a real strength in that. So I think uh, the medical education uh, needs to change now, and I'm sure you all can uh, contribute for that. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Asiri And Now, uh, we are moving to a brand new medical school that is the Sabaragam University, one of the newest in Sri Lanka. And Professor Nirmali Vikramaratna is the current dean of the faculty. And uh, Professor Nirmali, would you like to discuss about the challenges that you face as a new medical school and how you are? facing them and overcoming them. Uh, Professor Nirmali, over to you. Yes. Uh, thank you, Professor Indika Karnathilaka and uh, the President's uh, Sri Lanka Medical Association and Dr. Uh, Sajit Singer for inviting me to uh, deliver these uh, challenges that we are facing today as a new faculty of medicine. And I should uh, start with saying we are the youngest faculty of medicine for the chain of medical faculties of the Sri Lankan state medical universities. So um, one thing we are privileged to have it and also to start with, I have to say thank you to all the rest of the deans of the, all the medical faculties because they have supported us tremendously to come up with this. So at present we have only the preclinical departments functioning and uh, it was inaugurally opened only in uh, last year, 2019. We accepted our first batch, just to give you a briefing of the medic medical faculty. We accepted 70 students as the first batch and 75 students, uh, 2020, January, we accepted as our second batch. So at this moment, we are in the process of uh, recruiting staff members for the pre uh, paraclinical departments. And so uh, you understand that we are only at the preclinical stage of the where the program is concerned. So uh, this situation was not ever expected, I think, from by most of the uh, academics. And it was a big challenge to go into a virtual mode of teaching. So I have to thank my staff members, my staff members, which who are very young. And uh, although they, uh, they were young, they were very uh, uh, happy to take up the challenge and they were all willing to go online for teaching. And uh, however, we had uh, so many challenges because the, uh, if you know our university alone is also a very young university. So uh, getting into the system, uh, setting up the LMS for the faculty, then uh, opening up the space, the amount of the, the space that they allow us to upload the data was very uh, limited. So we had to go on improving this time to time and we had to have so much of discussion. So we had to uh, 
go on talk i mean improving this uh, so the so the one thing that most of the speakers uh, mentioned it before also like uh, apart from the physical res i mean we had to improve the physical resources as well as the human resources so how human resources were very very good and they went on their own ways and they found a lot of things that we what we could be doing online and to be very interactive so developing physical resources and um, human resources was a challenge and then again uh, it was also mentioned that uh, most of our students who are coming from some remote areas are facing the i mean difficulty of actually getting access because they don't have this uh, data facilities so so i think the standing committee also is trying to resolve that issue talking to the data providers to increase the strength of the signals so that they can access. So these were some things that Sri Lanka was not prepared for. Not only the medical faculty, the whole system, the Sri Lanka was not prepared to face such system. So unlike other universities in the other part of the world, it was very difficult for us to get into it. Even as of today, the students are, some students are facing difficulties. So even with those difficulties, I had to thank the medical students also. However, they are still continuing. They are trying managing themselves to get in and log in and share the information that we provide them as uh, to, to uh, continue their education. So just to uh, brief you what we have been doing at Sabaragama University, my faculty of medicine is, I'm sure this is what all the other faculties also do. So we are actually a very young university, so you can help us out uh, in any other uh, special modes that you have. So we do uh, PowerPoint presentations uh, in voice and upload to the LMS and then Zoom, through Zoom we do the lecturing and uh, there we find the students to be very interactive. We also do the practicals, but, and then SAQ, SEQs, and then we give students tasks online that they have to submit uh, every week. So regular discussions are being taken place, small group discussions, peer group discussions. We upload SAQs and even essay questions. We give them tutorials, we mark them, and we get them down. And uh, even the laboratory classes, we are trying to do as maximum as possible. Uh, so these are, uh, our staff members prefer to go with Google Classroom, which is very interactive. So these are some things I'm showing you that here, our staff has uh, done uh, Google Classroom evaluations. So which is easy that they get the evaluations, the number of people who have submitted, and then the marks, everything can be tabulated easily. Uh, then these are some, uh, programs that our Department of Anatomy has been using. Just like the anatomy department always say that is the most tedious section to be taught, I think they are the people who had most of the resources already available online for them to use. So they had couple, a lot of resources. So these are some of the resources that they have been using. And some of these are free and some of these we had to pay. And these were sent to us by the students saying this is how they do some mobile apps used by students for their self-learning. Uh, so for histology, they do the blue histology. This is how they do the slides, descriptions of slides and stuff for the students. And for the practical sessions in biochemistry and physiology in both, that we do the, we upload the videos or video demonstrations for the students. And prior to the, I mean, along with that, we do the pre-lab for the students through Zoom or and LMS. And the students have to submit a report on what they see and that is being uh, corrected, graded and returned to the students. Also, we give uh, MCQs and Zoom meetings are done to uh, do their uh, questions, answering their questions regarding the practicals. So this is one of the examples that the students have submitted their reports. So this is also some examples of Zoom meetings that we had uh, with the stu students. So the students have been very good and very interactive. They come up with their questions and the lecturers and the demonstrators in charge 
do provide immediate uh, solutions to them online. So this is another example of a clarification that is provided on a, a practical. So however, we think there are limitations and there are certain things that they should have hands-on experience. So that is uh, limited uh, during this uh, virtual teaching. So when they come back, however, we think uh, uh, we could give them their hands-on experience in a very short period of time. And uh, we expect to finish um, most of the lectures online, because preclinical lectures, I think 100% the lectures can be covered through online, uh, but like uh, what it was said, uh, so it's a teaching and learning process. Uh, so we have to do continuous evaluations to see how much they have learned. And also with our own experience, we know when it's a classroom session, it's more interactive and we can immediately evaluate how much they get in. So that aspect is uh, missing in this way. So if we can develop certain uh, measures um, to develop such uh, evaluation methods to see, ensure that students uh, grab whatever we teach. But again, I think this is a very good challenge for the students. Uh, because uh, uh, university education is not spoon feeding and uh, it's the responsibility of the student to learn on their own. Self-learning should be encouraged. And uh, uh, so this challenge is not only for the staff members to upload their information in an, in an interactive manner so the students can do their self-learning, but it's also a challenge for the students to improve themselves. And this would be uh, helping them to improve their critical and analytical thinking uh, because they would have to do their own self-study and go on improving and improving so uh, throughout. So they would uh, ultimately would think into a certain uh, case if I, uh, more critically and they would be able to resolve or provide solutions in a better practical manner. So this is uh, what we are at Sabargam University and we already think there are so many aspects that we can, uh, ways that we can improve. We can get the whiteboard, interactive whiteboards and uh, pooling of meetings. So there are other things that my staff has brought up like to buy them certain software programs. And also I'm trying to get our computer staff to come and assist us to uh, have these online evaluation uh, uh, methods. So uh, that's what we are at Sabargam University today. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah thank you. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. And I think quite impressive as a young university, what you have done and uh, related to the current situation, the challenges. And maybe probably uh, there is an advantage in coming new also because then you can start on your own with a lot of innovations. And uh, sure. another important point that you brought up is that if we can help each other, Sri Lankan universities, they have their strong areas and the strength areas. And if they can help each other, that would also help us to improve our medical education. So thank you very much. And uh, we'll move to the next presentation. Uh, thank you, sir. Our uh, next uh, speaker is Dr. Raviraj, the Dean, Faculty of Medicine, University of Jaffna. Over to you, sir. Problem is, first of all, thank you very much, Indika and Sajid. Uh, uh, you made a lot of effort and uh, organized this meeting with our colleague deans. Uh, I, I feel the um, important thing, first of all, uh, we are against for the corona, but uh, <laughs> I am thankful to corona. We all now think about uh, after this corona incident, uh, COVID incident, we are thinking about the electronic teaching, upgrading our, that is a good thing and good improvement. Um, even so many bad things by the COVID, but this is a good thing uh, because all the university deans and uh, 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 teachers, academic staff are very keen on now we are upgrading the electronic system of teaching. 
and I have found in my faculty uh, the last couple of months, uh, most of the students at as uh, they are very happy about as our deans earlier, the deans, my colleagues, deans told. Uh, they are very happy about the electronic teaching, first of all. And the uh, other thing I like to suggest, we have to continue, not for, for a temporary, as a temporary teaching, but we have to continue certain percentage uh, in future. Uh, my suggestion is at least the pre-clinical and the paraclinical teaching, that is that I mean up to fourth year, uh, most of the lectures and the tutorials can be uh, conducted uh, through the either Zoom or LMS or Google method, whatever the method we add up is up to my university, but we can continue our teaching. I will say roughly about 60% we can go up to the uh, electronic teaching. But at the same time, face-to-face -face teaching is very important especially in the clinical scenarios. Uh, that also we can't uh, forget because that is the best method for the teaching of the clinical things. But even in the clinical section, we are able to teach such as, as mentioned earlier, our Prof. Asri and Prof. Uh, uh, Suranki, we can conduct certain amount of clinical approach also, like a, a program-based uh, learning or some case uh, scenario discussion or like a symposium we, get, we can organize by the uh, electronic medium. Um, at the same uh, time, uh, clinical teaching, I feel my opinion is roughly about 25 to 30 percent only we can able to do by the electronic medium, but uh, uh, the rest of the thing is by the uh, clinical practice. That's very important clinical uh, uh, practice because they are going to become a doctor and they have to move with the uh, patients. The patient-doctor relationship, communication skill, practical skills has to be, uh, we have to adapt through our clinical teaching. And if you uh, consider the other thing, uh, the UGC and uh, Ministry of Higher Education have to give priority now to upgrade our uh, uh, electronic method of teaching for the students as well as staff. And other you know, few things uh, in future, uh, one of the set up an example, I think we are going to start the exam for the final years on uh, Monday. And it's a good trial for us to see what we can uh, do in future. Uh, even other, my suggestion is uh, we can go on other bottleneck exams that we discuss in the UGC standing committee also. Uh, for an example, depend on the university, what budgets are having the bottleneck exam. For an example, uh, if in our faculty, uh, the batch before uh, 40th batch, that is in the phase one, uh, having the exam, expected to have the exam in August. Then we can fix like that and we can accelerate our programs. And more than that, I think most of our previous deans have discussed most of the things. And uh, <clears throat> Uh, regarding other issues, uh, we need, uh, we had some workshops for our academic staff regarding on the Zoom and Google approach or LMS method. Uh, some of them are not familiar, very few, but most of them are very, uh, they are very familiar to this type of, type of teaching. Um, I hope uh, we have to give now the time is the priority to electronic method of teaching. At the same time, we have to see that clinical teaching should be uh, continued once the uh, situation improves. That's all I can say. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, we'll move on to the next speaker with the time. Uh, the next speaker, uh, I would like to uh, Hand over to Professor Indika to introduce the next speaker. Yes, uh, our, we are moving to uh, another 
special university in Sri Lanka, which was uh, the Eastern University, again started at the very beginning. Also, the Eastern University have been using distance learning uh, very much and very prominently in their learning program. I would like to invite the Dean uh, of the Eastern University, Dr. Angela Ulfakasam. Uh, Dr. Angela, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Indika. Uh, good afternoon to you, and good afternoon, Dr. Sajid, the fellow deans, and all participants. Uh, <clears throat> um, so I just thought I'll use a presentation. Um, so future of medical education adapting to new norms. Um, so as uh, thank you very much, Professor Indika, for telling, uh, saying uh, that we are a special university, our special medical faculty. I'm really honored to hear that from you. From you. So just a word of our, the mission of our faculty. Our mission is uh, to produce men and women of high standards in the practice and delivery of healthcare. So now our thinking or our challenge today is, can we achieve standards, this high standard? Can we impart the high standard to our students in the current situation? Well, uh, just um, offhand, I can say, yes, we can do that and we'll see why. Now, our faculty uh, started in um, Biogazette notification in 2005 with six departments. And this again has been a challenge to us from many sites asking why six departments, uh, why not uh, 16? Uh, so we find this quite accommodative and uh, uh, supportive to our curriculum. And we had the first batch of students in 2006 and they passed out in 2012. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> up to now, we have had uh, seven batches of uh, medical graduates, and uh, and many of them, up to 30 or more, even more, uh, have completed um, their their PG MG training, MD training, and they are waiting a board certification. And they have gone to various fields of medicine, like medicine, surgery, and subspecialties as well. And uh, a few of them have just started going abroad. So one of the first batch student has uh, ended up in USA and she's doing quite well and we get very good reports of her. And some of them, three of them exactly, have joined as lecturers. And unfortunately, we have had a dropouts also, just two of them, uh, but I guess that uh, that's, that cannot be helped. Right? So we tried our best to keep them, but couldn't. And a little bit about the med uh, medical pro MBBS program of FHCS. Uh, we started with a unique curricular concept and structure. Uh, this is because of the involvement of uh, leading medical educationists at that time, Professor Varagunam and the others like uh, Professor Gunananda, Maheshwar and, and other uh, educationists. And uh, we follow the SPICES model. Um, we are the, uh, the, the teaching or the learning is mainly student-centered, problem-based, integrated, community-based with electives and um, has, an, uh, has a systematic approach. So this is the model uh, proposed by Harden. So here our program, uh, as in other programs, uh, consists of three phases. And each for, uh, phase uh, is composed of integrated modules where as opposed to distinct disciplines. So each module will have contribution from various disciplines. And um, therefore, uh, a, a single group of lecturers may not be enough, right? So we were, the, we were sort of the, one of the first schools to adapt this. And I know now uh, many schools are following this model. And there is an assessment held at the end of each module and the feedbacks are given. And um, this is again a little bit of challenge, whether it's a formative or uh, summative. Now currently it has been an issue for us because now we want to have these online assessments and we are not very experienced in this, uh, do we get these assessment marks and so on. And then of course we have this early exposure to clinical and community field and um, we use a GPS system. So that's just a, a general introduction to the program uh, we are following. Yes, in general, also we face a lot of challenges, right, as opposed to current problems. So the general problems or the problems we faced earlier are, of course, the physical resources. And we have been here for more than 14 years, but we are still at a 
temporary building. So we, our lecture halls have limited uh, capacity. And even now parents call and tell, why are you taking only 80 students? Our students, our children are waiting outside, make it 120. But we simply cannot do it at this point because our lecture halls are small. But however, um, next year, things will change. We are getting a new building complex with large lecture halls and uh, state-of-the-art um, teaching equipment. Um, and uh, then, um, of course, uh, the inability to recruit qualified um, professionals, and ma especially medical professionals with MBBS degrees, uh, quite a problem. Uh, this is not uh, only due to the geographical uh, uh, situation where we are, which is a disadvantage, also the monetary aspects. I'm sure all of you all will understand and agree with me. And uh, not only that, the non-academic cadre is also very difficult to fill. Now, what are the new challenges we are facing? Accommodation. Now, accommodation actually is a very good, uh, we do have like a, uh, uh, at the current position, we are overcrowded. We are able to accommodate all the students and we are getting two more hostels as well. And we are now, according to the new problems uh, which we face, our medical, our medical microbiology, uh, um, our lecturer and microbiologist uh, has given us some guidelines. And so therefore we are trying to follow that, like accommodating one or two students per room and so on. Currently it's not a problem. As soon as they start, they start coming, we will face that. The cafeteria, right? How are they going to sit and eat? Um, do we have enough space to have a, maintain a social uh, distancing when they're eating? What about the extracurricular activities? We are trying to produce a holistic uh, individual, not an academic or just a person with knowledge. So we are, how do we develop these things? And of course, the clinical appointments. So we want to avoid crowding of the wards and clinics and continuation of the online teaching. So even once we start the university, open up the faculties, um, then we need to continue the online aspect as well. So do we have adequate connectivity and data? So all our students are very good. They don't, they, they never complain. They, if, it's, if data is not, if uh, connectivity is not in their area, they are very good, they are good enough to move to another uh, town or a nearby town and get it. So. That's what they tell me. So they, they never say, please, madam, we don't have data. Please don't do this. They always say, please do it. We will find data anyway, right? And uh, the, when, once they start, uh, the, then we do have to have face-to-face -face sessions as well. So we have to um, limit the number. How do we limit the numbers in the classroom? So that's an, another challenge. Uh, then, uh, of course, again, I'm coming back to the other as aspect of student life, sports, social events talent shows. All these are integral part of the faculty life. How are we going to accommodate all these things? Right. Um, thank you. So next, yeah. So what are the steps we have taken? So the, the universal or the standard precautions which we have been advised, uh, we are following, right? So some of them we have already established like hand washing facilities almost at every entrance um, in the hospital or the faculty, the hostels we have the university was good enough to establish for us. Uh, then we have thought that we will have to break the clinical groups into small, which we are working on it for the other, uh, not the final years, the other, the, pre, uh, the, the final years as well. And then to give them chances, like alternating them from morning and afternoon. So the challenge here is um, somebody has to be with them to guide them, right? They can't just go and uh, learn on their own. Whatever said and done, students do learn by themselves more than what we teach, but still uh, we have to um, break the groups into two uh, and have morning and afternoon sessions to limit the numbers in the ward. Then uh, in the non-clinical subjects, we have to do, go more for the uh, small group discussions and PBLs. So for that, we need more space. As I told you earlier, we are already short of space, so how are you going to do this? So uh, thing was suggested, maybe we should put some temporary huts or something where we can accommodate smaller groups of students to conduct these and um, to establish spaces to introduce these and, uh, and to motivate the staff to do this. Now, all this time, it was very difficult for, for us to motivate the staff to go for PBS. Mm -hmm. But as Professor Asari said, it's a blessing in disguise. Now we are forced to 
go and participate in these uh, things. Right, and the library, we have opened the library with precautions. We have had, uh, we have a washing facility, sanitizing facilities, and the librarians are very supportive uh, to allow the students to sit uh, in a social distancing. And again, extracurricular activities, uh, which is, I'm um, again and again mentioning this, uh, we have some student clubs. We are promoting these student clubs and student activities because we want them to develop their, not only their knowledge, but their whole personality. So already they are involved. So we are in contact with them. So we have, we are also, the staff is also involved in their groups and uh, they are very good. They are already producing um, short films and videos uh, in a remote manner, which is uh, new to us because we are from a different generation and they would call us bloomers or some sort of name they have for us, I guess. But these new, uh, these students, this younger generation, they are very creative and they have already, more, many of them are involved in uh, this type of activities. So I guess wow. that, that will uh, continue. Uh, then mentoring. So as somebody mentioned, the students are depressed. So we always uh, encourage our staff members. Already there are mentors. So they are in contact with their um, students. They are mentees, so uh, we can we give them some um, uh, uh, social, I mean, psychological support. So every day, like almost every day, or once in two or three days, I get message, Madam, when will it start? Like that. So when we speak to them and when we um, reassure them, they are happy. And uh, I'm surprised to see many of the students have already come to Vatico and they are living in and around. Like they don't want to stay at home. They feel better here. And the Eastern University also has started sort of an online yoga for staff and students, which I have not uh, participated, but I hear it is very good. So uh, those are the things to support the students, uh, which are being, um, some of them we have to do in future and some are already in practice. Right, and uh, what are the advantages gained by this uh, COVID uh, pandemic, uh, the, the newly emerging problems, right? So as someone said, uh, it is a blessing in disguise in some ways. Staff are turning to technology. Earlier, we used to arrange workshops for uh, LMS and only one or two turn up and they're also very reluctant to use it. Now, everyone is troubling the resource people. Uh, how do I do this? So they are going after the um, people who know it and they are trying to follow it. So it's a good thing. And uh, we have more access to remote teachers now. We don't have to arrange the transport. We don't have to. Now, it is not expected. Earlier, it was expected that lecture should, lecturer should come. Now, uh, it's fine. So um, even from Peradenia, the um, forensic people, Professor Dinesh and all, they are very happy to teach our students in a remote way, in, in over the video. And uh, so we have a wide uh, variety, a spectrum of people whom we can utilize. So that is a very good thing. And uh, we have to look into the possibility of online exams. Now, as we said, we belong to a different generation. We don't like it. We look at it in a sort of a, a, a skeptical way. Suspicious students will look at the book. Students will go to, go to the internet and answer. But uh, as someone earlier mentioned, it is a quite a standard uh, thing in the established uh, worldwide universities. So we too should look into the possibility of these online assessments and uh, take the marks officially, right? Not only just practice it, but uh, we have to take it, take it very seriously. And of course, the environment has changed into a um, very, it has been uh, changed to a very uh, favorable environment for self-directed learning. For example, uh, now when we break the groups and send them in the morning and afternoon and all, uh, students are forced to learn by themselves, right? So um, um, I think it is a good thing. Now we don't um, have didactic lectures or ward classes where I make them sit and listen to what I say. Now they, have, they are more in, uh, by themselves, so that I think that is a good thing. Even though now we don't have clinicals, I get um, we all of us, all of the clinical uh, clinical sciences department, we are conducting our lectures and having discussions over WhatsApp and other media. So students are very interactive and they want to learn. Especially in the final year, I have found uh, students' attitude changes drastically. They want to learn. They want to be better. So this is a this is good for them, I think. We should uh, maintain that um, 
not that COVID, that um, learning environment. And uh, whether there will be less ragging, I am very, I'm looking forward to it because less student interaction, I don't know. So um, that's about it. So thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. And thanks. Right, uh, thank you, madam. Uh, a, for a small question I just want to ask from you since you mentioned about the library facilities. Yeah. Right now, what are the measures that you all have? Can you elaborate on that? Uh, uh, what are the measures that you all have taken uh, to lend the books? And once the students return yes. the books, uh, any sort of measures that you all will implement to disinfect or yes. to uh, yeah. prevent um, the spread of COVID? Yes, two things. One is... Um, uh, the, li the library has established itself a digital uh, repository, digital books. So that is uh, for the use of the students. Those who come physically also, the standard precautions uh, we maintain, like um, the books are kept, uh, they are not handled, given hand to hand. Like So according to the advice given by the microbiologist, uh, the hand sanitation, sanitizers will be available. So whenever they handle, they have to clean their hands. And the books which are returned will be kept for some time and then they can be used. So these are very practical things like we don't have to go and disinfect or spray anything. Very simple but practical efficient way where we can stop the viral spread are being practiced. And of course the sunlight. Right, thank you madam. So uh, we'll move on to the next uh, speaker. Our next speaker is the Dean of uh, of the Faculty of uh, Medicine and Allied Health Sciences, University of Prajarata, uh, Dr. Seneca Pilapitiya. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Professor Indika and uh, Dr. Sajid for this opportunity. I also share most of the, the views of uh, most of the deans that were presented. So what I will do is I will tell the story of uh, Rajarata on establishing or, or, or during this uh, COVID-19 period and so through that to highlight uh, the opportunities we had, the challenges we faced, and also uh, the, uh, I think the advances we could make in this uh, online platform. So uh, when uh, the universities were closed, uh, about, three, about three days after the head of our medical education unit called me and said, uh, I think we should seriously think of uh, establishing our online platform. Till then, we had only one or two departments uh, delivering uh, certain contents of their course through the online platform. So I think, uh, so there was a consensus, yes, we should go. And by uh, 18th of March, we uh, formulated a faculty policy and a faculty, a, a draft of a, a kind of a faculty guide to uh, proceed on establishing this uh, online platform in a greater way. And we had a quick discussion with all the heads of the department and then uh, all agreed. And uh, one of the first things we did was the uh, assessment of the staff uh, readiness for uh, establishing this uh, online teaching platform. So uh, then we uh, identified a few problems, the, you know, uh, the training needs of the staff and so on. And immediately we started a, a coordinated uh, some CPD activities by our own staff members who are very competent in this uh, uh, field. And we start uh, training the staff. And meanwhile, we also conducted a student readiness survey. Uh, and through that, we found the, the real situation of the students because we were worried that they might not have adequate access, though we run a good course. And uh, what we found was uh, most of them had uh, internet access and about 73% said they have good at internet access. It was only about uh, two to three students for a batch who had real difficulties. So even then we got their addresses and there was a mechanism to uh, uh, deal with them. And we were having regular discussions with all the batch trips and the union. And uh, one other interesting thing that we found was about 55% of our students were using their mobile phones. So they did not have laptops or tabs. So we had to keep in mind that the quality of the at the uh, other end, uh, you know, was on that level. So uh, with the CPD sessions, the staff got ready. And by about 30th March, we were uh, ready to run this uh, full uh, the, the course in a greater way. And we agreed as a faculty that all of the departments will conduct one credit 
uh, uh, for a week of their course content. And all whatever that were doing the theoretical stuff uh, through lectures and tutorials, we agreed upon that each department, depending on the batch the, and the, their uh, course, uh, that we will uh, conduct it. And that there was a kind of a monitoring mechanism centrally that to see that each department will deliver a content that is equivalent to one credit for a week. So uh, we went ahead with this uh, for about two, three weeks. And then also uh, at the same time we decided now uh, one problem with this online uh, platform is that we can teach them, we can deliver certain study material, but the one-to-one -one interaction is the issue because when we conduct a tutorial, there will be questions being asked even the same with the lectures. So one way we thought was we will follow each of these teaching activities with a formative assessment. So actually if you take from the normal norm, we won't hold that much of formative assessments after each teaching activity. But one good thing that originated from this was after each teaching activity, there was a, some form of a formative assessment so that the students, we assured that they get involved in that. Otherwise, uh, we might be putting it up in the platform and the students might not be really uh, uh, getting the uh, outcome. So we, uh, there was an increase in the number of formative assessments that were, we were following and it was basically after each uh, teaching activity. And uh, at the same time, we created through our LMS a separate CPD portal for the staff to make sure that they keep on improving on their uh, teaching, uh, act, uh, you know, the skills re uh, needed for these online teaching activities. And uh, then at the same time, we also thought that the students in this, uh, following another survey, we identified that some of the students, uh, you know, were not having all these uh, the skills that is there for needed for uh, self-directed learning plus for a platform, uh, you know, the kind of t uh, learning that they should carry on with the online platform. So there was a, a survey where we looked into, uh, you know, their time management, their uh, the study time, uh, they are preferred ways of uh, uh, learning and uh, the met metacognitive skills. So uh, with this assessment, we found that they also do not have the necessary skills, though we could establish a good platform. Some of them lack the skills. So uh, understanding them uh, that, uh, so we, they, we uh, establish another uh, CPD for them to understand on self-directed uh, learning Plus also we introduced them a kind of a uh, self-reflective log. So uh, then we uh, promoted them to keep them. This was a more of a, this was not a necessity, but we promoted them to maintain this log. And for uh, actually, even at the moment, there are some students who are maintaining, but uh, currently we still don't have an assessment for that, but uh, we have introduced it. So uh, then of course, uh, the modes that we uh, used to deliver our uh, teaching content, we used uh, the standard uh, PowerPoint slides, which were audio recorded. And then there were video recorded uh, lectures. And with the Zoom coming in, we introduced Zoom lectures and Zoom case-based discussion. Particularly the clinical departments established this uh, case-based discussion because by the time of closure, uh, every department had uh, one uh, appointment was done. So the students have their own uh, case histories. So we got them to present a case history and would discuss uh, in, you know, similar to a ward class uh, through the Zoom-based case-based discussion. This was one of the most attractive uh, uh, ways of learning for the students. And of course, again, we held a survey and I think we had even uh, have sent an abstract to the SLMA on, uh, for sub uh, submitted. Uh, what we found was a student find it as a very, uh, uh, promising or uh, way of learning and they really like it. In fact, the, the staff opinion is slightly differed in that and actually the students say we really love it and there were some comments from the staff saying uh, my teaching has vanished in thin air. So that was, you know, there were two different perspectives from the staff and the students, but it went on and it is still continuing as a very uh, effective way of doing the clinical ward classes. And I think for the future, what we are thinking is we can follow this similarly, even when the students come in, so they can, one student can take a case history. And then of course, uh, you can do the same uh, word class or the case-based discussion using Zoom uh, with the students being at hostels or different uh, places. So uh, then of course, uh, 
we uh, followed these uh, models of uh, teaching and uh, there were regular evaluations of the effectiveness uh, you know uh, the, of this uh, process and uh, at one point, after about eight weeks, we thought that we should also monitor the real student activity. So we evaluated all the logins data for the last uh, seven weeks, uh, the first seven weeks, and so saw that some of the students do not uh, log in uh, frequently enough. So indicating that their intake is not adequate. So what we did was like now we have appointed for each department uh, a kind of a, a temporary lecturer who will be looking into uh, the login data of students for that particular course uh, or the subject on a weekly basis and will be giving a feedback. And in the faculty board, there is a, we came to agreement that we will start a mentoring program for the online training uh, activity so that now the students are assigned for the teachers and they will be personally looking into these data and following up with the students. It's a kind of, a, it's a non-threatening, it's, but it's a way of uh, a kind of a promoting the student involvement and to find out also if any student is uh, their uh, login is less because of a practical issue of course uh, we as the faculty would intervene and try to sort it out in fact uh, you know one of in during these surveys also during the covid period we found about 18 students who were having real financial constraints and actually there was a support mechanism for that so uh, similarly, uh, so now uh, uh, the uh, mentoring program is being initiated where each student will be mentored on this particular, not, not on other matters, but on the uh, online teaching process. And at the same time, uh, we did, a, uh, after about 10 weeks, we did a survey on their psychological status. We just wanted to know whether if the students are too anxious and whether they have worries and all that. And that also uh, indicated that they have certain anxieties. They are, you know, sometimes... Uh, uh, you know, it, 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 uh, in the previous survey also, we saw that some of the times they do not have a right environment and so on. So we have all that data. So in time, if it is getting extended, we thought we can even offer few students who have real difficulties on continuing these activities, the hostel facilities. So because then, of course, we can provide enough room and uh, so on. So I think getting that data was also very useful for us to uh, provide the uh, future uh, uh, model of uh, training where all the students will have an equal opportunity to follow this online platform. Otherwise, depending on the resources they have, there might be a variability of them on uh, the uh, usage of this uh, platform. Then the other thing that uh, uh, came is uh, the student, uh, the, uh, super, the, the peer assisted learning. So now, there is a, this is also one common thing that when the faculty is uh, on, the students have their own mechanisms of peer-assisted learning. And even following a major exam, when they have the repeat, they have those, you know, we all know they call it kuppi, and they have this peer-assisted thing. So uh, we, we have conducted our second MBBS and have issued the results. And one of the requests when we had the discussions with the student is and now they have no opportunity to do this peer-assisted learning. So uh, there was a request from the uh, students, can we use the same LMS platform that, and so we had a very, uh, 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 you know, wide discussion on this in the faculty board. And what we thought was we will create another portal or a course for peer assisted learning, but in this case, it will be a supervised one. So which will, you know, when this peer assisted learning goes on, sometimes you also deliver false facts for students and so on. But so there will be a little bit of uh, supervision, not a full supervision, and we will still create a, 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 a pathway in the LMS for them to uh, continue with this peer assisted learning. So this is, I think, uh, uh, one uh, new thing that we thought that we will incorporate it for LMS. So uh, these are the uh, few things that we uh, uh, could establish. And I think actually, and we had a weekly assessment of how much of the content we are delivering. And when it comes to theory, except for the practicals and the clinicals, basically every department was uh, delivering about 80 to anything between 80 to 100 percent of their theoretical content, where we had the limitations of the practical. And now, of course, uh, we have decided on to like uh, on the previous presentation, some of the practicals are now being done through LMS, but the clinicals, except for case based discussions, we have not been able to uh, uh, deliver anything uh, other than uh, uh, in the clinical training component. 
so this is uh, our experience of introducing and i think uh, the challenges we have is to make sure that our students at the receiving end has the reasonable facilities to access them second thing is to uh, get our uh, staff being further trained and then to get the necessary equipments to you know to do it in a better level and then sometimes we need a, a i think uh, you know over the time even the mindset changed you know when we were talking about clinical based discussions with the clinical departments you know they said don't talk about clinical training how can you replace it and so on but as the uh, time went on there was quite a, a good uh, response and the involvement from all the clinical departments as well so the things are changing for the better and i think as we go on even when we open up and we can still uh, adapt some of these practices to for a better training and get them transferred to the more technology based uh, interventions to deliver it thank you thank you dr senak pilipiti again i think uh, rajrati is also unique in one way because been in a, in a rural area so and also you are drawing students uh, Uh, mainly from those regional areas as well do you think the students have faced this adverse situation in a resilient way with limited resources yes i think uh, yes from the students uh, aspect i think uh, they are uh, how they have uh, tackled this situation and how they have got adapted is very good but then of course i think uh, they need to be taught on you know self directed learning that is what from our surveys we found that it's not uh, you know 80% or 90% there is about 50 to 60% who are doing it well but then there are about another 40% who are not uh, do not have the the skills of you know having their own study plan uh, you know checking it uh, whether they can uh, whether they are achieving it and so on this is particularly towards uh, you know junior batches like the students who have been there for 3 4 years in the faculty are better off in that sense but the younger ones are i think they need uh, more input from that uh, if you are to be very successful in this thank you and uh, now let's move into the another young university that's yamu university and uh, again uh, dr sanjeev bawat again i think he's one of the newly appointed deans dr sanjeev can you elaborate on what yamu university has done to face this current situation and also to move forward you all good afternoon Good afternoon to you all. Uh, thank you for offering this uh, remarkable opportunity to uh, give a, uh, you some idea about the 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 second possibly the second youngest uh, faculty. Uh, much has been spoken about already, but I would like to address uh, this gathering on uh, four lines. I un I understood that I would like to uh, I should uh, reiterate after listening to uh, many uh, panelists. Uh, and at the same time i understand that this is the time has gone uh, wrong way so i will be very uh, short as well my first uh, section is uh, uh, about the faculty this this faculty started in 2018 it is only 2 years old we have only two batches and the university also is relatively young from 1999 the wyambe university and uh, we being very young we have a a handful of uh, academics so far because uh, the pre clinical departments are functioning we are waiting to hold the second mbbs barrier exam in august august most likely after the elections waiting for the approval from the government as well uh, then the clinical training and the para clinical training will have to be commenced uh, those will be tailored according to the, the events that are taking place in in the world uh, and for which we are slowly uh, preparing uh, again with uh, the uh, with the uh, some hardships of uh, shortage of academic staff and non academic staff the 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 card approvals are not happening in a timely manner uh, for that purpose i am really thankful for some of the established universities they they have already expressed their willingness to share their uh, content academic content that's a remarkable achievement remarkable uh, uh, feat by those universities uh, at the same time would like to uh, mention that since we are very uh, young and very few academics are here i have i have been uh, vested with uh, the uh, the pleasure of informing that uh, we have a large uh, faculty board represented by very senior professors and other professors and senior personalities from uh, most of the uh, universities in sri lanka 
except a few, mainly Colombo, uh, Java, and Calamia Peridini. There is a large representation, representation uh, covering most of the departments, so that uh, though we are though we are very few in number in, in, the, in the premises permanently, we have a very high eminent group of people advising, preparing and modifying the, revising the curricula. So in, in that scenario, we feel we are very well adjusted in that line. So that, that's a very good beginning. And uh, at the same time, I would like to say, a beginning of a faculty will be a challenging task. Yes, amidst the challenging nature, we have the, uh, the, the hidden benefit that we can establish all these uh, new novel methods and novel medical education uh, aspects into this curriculum, which we have amply done it already. We are waiting for the UGC approval uh, for the revised curricula uh, from the subject-based curricula to we have moved to more module-based curricula, incorporating most of the novel uh, practices. We have, uh, uh, we have very seriously gone into the uh, the global standards uh, uh, sub, uh, given by the World Federation of Medical Education. We have consulted the Sri Lanka qualification framework and we have taken the seriously the SLMA, uh, the SLMA guide, guidelines already available. We have gone into UGC benchmark like that. We have gone into uh, what are the relevant things. Also, we have gone into association of uh, American uh, medical colleges uh, guidelines in some of these skills related training, like uh, 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 the entrustable professional activities we have included as far as possible. While saying so, we have included only, we have not seen they are actually happening because we are yet to see the, uh, yet to see these practices taking place when we start clinical practices. So this is anyway, I, I believe is a good, good, beginning and we had the freedom for a very good beginning and we, we I'm, I'm, I'm assuring you that we will take utmost all the, our efforts to implement them as they appear in our curricula as well. The second segment that I would like to uh, address is what we are doing during this uh, COVID-19 related pan, pan university closure. Uh, it is more or less similar to what the other uh, other speakers uh, expressed. We have, fortunately, we have only two batches. They have been, their education has been halted at um, different semesters. Uh, our biggest challenge is the senior students. They are facing their secondary examination barrier in a, uh, one or two months' time. Uh, we have planned it for August, uh, for which, fortunately, we have completed most of the practical related work. So they, they are only some few modules which could be almost 100% uh, uh, function through the online uh, module, on, online uh, Moodle associated uh, teaching learning activity. So that was a, a blessing that we had. The junior students were in their first semester halfway through. So we continued the, the rest of the semester uh, using most of, the, most of the techniques that has been already discussed by you we did not i wouldn't say we did any remarkable uh, um, experimental success we did the same uh, uh, modalities used by others the zoom platform the audio dubbed powerpoints a lot of assignments and uh, some of the practical uh, uh, practical uh, software such as excellence for anatomy like that we use them and and we did something i would like to uh, mention specifically that we looked at how successful they are by uh, having a student feedback as well as uh, the looking at uh, student participation. I would like to express that our students are participating 100% except on uh, Zoom platform uh, related lectures at the same time. So they couldn't uh, participate at that time to counter that deficiency we have, uh, we have instructed and our, our academics have done it remarkably to, uh, to uh, record them and to uh, make them available for the students to download at uh, easier times when the internet, internet connectivity is better. So in that scenario, I would say we have achieved 100% in reaching uh, all the academic uh, uh, the content as well as 100% uh, student participation, though they were not uh, on timely manner, but participation is 100%. And uh, at the same time, I, we have, uh, we had already noted some of the students who were uh, uh, 
performing poorly at exams. So I have uh, I have handed o- handed their uh, handed over their activities to be supervised by some of the demonstrators, uh, the junior uh, doctors, uh, and they have uh, they have done a very remarkable uh, uh, follow up of these activities and and has made and have made sure that uh, the even the poorly performed students are catching up with the online teaching. So I, I, my, uh, my and our uh, faculty's uh, view is we have achieved a really uh, remarkable uh, online teaching activity up to now. And we can, uh, we can go on with the online teaching for some more time uh, with the junior students uh, expecting that we are over, over the entire period of online teaching, our ac- academics have as far as possible identified some of the practicals or lectures which needs some uh, revision when the students are physically coming back to university so that we can offer some sort of a revision for the even the especially for those uh, difficult uh, sections in all three subjects uh, this uh, may be uh, allowed for the senior students waiting for uh, the second English barrier exam in, in terms of uh, giving them OSPI like uh, uh, activities to uh, refresh their, uh, some of the practical knowledge. So that, that's the plan uh, on that line. Uh, and I, I would say the feedback mechanism was really a, a useful one. The students uh, participated very well on feedback. So that, uh, that ensured that we were going in the right direction. The amount of uh, work that we gave in the online platform was like uh, two to three activities a day and uh, that uh, we looked at uh, the ex- experience in the international uh, situation also which, uh, which is more or less uh, uh, what we noted is it is almost the same uh, the workload. Uh, uh, having said that I'm moving on to my third uh, third segment which is uh, post COVID uh, restarting. Uh, the answer for that is uh, uh, we have we are following the University Grants Commission uh, regulations of uh, preparedness plan for post COVID reopening, which we are doing. Or in fact, all the faculties are uh, doing uh, this, and uh, we have uh, uh, drawn our plans on how to uh, take the students back, how the hostels are to be uh, allocated to students, one 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 room per student, as well as the uh, the, the healthy healthy activities at uh, canteens, uh, how the lecture halls are organized and how all these are discussed already. We are aiming first for the uh, second MBS uh, examination. The, the plans are underway uh, and uh, thereafter our, our plans are to conduct the online teaching uh, as far as possible uh, with uh, if the permission allowed to get the students down for practical uh, work and while continuing the online education until at a very later time when we can get them down for uh, when they when they can get them down for uh, physical uh, teaching in lecture halls and i i have uh, learned that uh, uh, that uh, uh, the government or the ugc is uh, promoting that we should continue with online teaching even after the corona related uh, issues are sorted because it, it is going to be a, that's the suggestion that it should be a, a, a long-term activity of uh, teaching learning activity amongst other uh, t- different activities uh, that we are conducting, uh, which we are, we, for which purpose we have already are in the process of amend, amending our curricula as to giving some 30, 10 to 30% of our lecture should go online hereafter. Uh, then the fourth is uh, the clinical training that, that's an issue for any medical faculty. So we also will face this in uh, October, November period. Uh, uh, we have uh, two hospitals, uh, Purunagal and Kuliapitya. Uh, there are designation and allocation uh, discussions are going on at ministry because uh, there, there should be official announcements. So those are being awaited. There are discussions going on. But anyway, uh, at the beginning, we are a little fortunate that our students are small in number so that we can uh, divide the students into very small groups such as nine per consultant. So in that scenario, we will be able to maintain some physical distancing when we actually start and we will be starting the training with it at Kuliapitya, which is not a very, uh, very at this minute, it's not uh, largely uh, populated with patients. So, so anyway, for the 
initial uh, clinical training, the history taking examination can be conducted in a less uh, populated uh, ward, which may not hinder their uh, quality of training. But later on, we are moving on to more advanced uh, uh, stages of clinical training. We are going to Kurunagala, the Kurunagala and Kuliapiti both have very kindly agreed to offer training. So those will be uh, organized and, and, and as an experience that we have received at uh, COVID, in, in COVID uh, uh, pandemic, that uh, the need for skills lab where we can offer clinical and any other training uh, when we are to, when we cannot visit hospitals. So we have uh, very very uh, fortunate enough to receive a AHEAD grant uh, of uh, 75 million very recently, uh, which paved way for us to establish a complete uh, uh, skills training uh, lab. Uh, we, we have done the initial purchasing uh, things, but it will take some time. But anyway, we are we have secured that fund for a complete uh, virtual lab, including uh, high fidelity mannequins and etc. So that we can utilize. Uh, maybe even uh, after the hospitals are started, we can some some proportion of the training can be done in a lab rather than sending to hospital, uh, which which we can decide with uh, expert clinicians later on. So that is about my uh, uh, my uh, plan of uh, uh, information that I thought of uh, offering you. Would like to answer any uh, any concerns from your side as well. Uh, I, at the end, I am thank I'm really thankful again for offering this opportunity uh, to share our uh, situation with all of you. Thank you very much. Right, thank you, sir. Uh, those are very valuable points. Uh, so we will move on uh, to the next uh, speaker, uh, to the group captain, uh, Dr. Namal Vijay Singh, the Dean, Faculty of Medicine, General Sri John Kotalawala Defense University. Over to you, sir. Thank you, uh, uh, R3 and uh, sorry, Ajit and uh, for building our letter, uh, and also all the fellow deans for giving us the opportunity. Uh, to share some uh, thoughts and uh, some information. Uh, and uh, the uh, first thing I want to tell you in a couple of minutes is uh, the difference between uh, the, the Kotala Defense University Medical Faculty and the rest of the state medical faculty. Because that, that uh, also involved with the different challenges that we will have to face uh, during uh, the uh, to you know uh, to conduct academic activities and clinical training in this uh, new normal situation. Uh, as you know, uh, KDU Medical Faculty is the, uh, the only non-UGC medical faculty, and this has uh, a diverse uh, uh, groups of students. Uh, I can divide them into three main groups. Uh, they are cadets. Uh, and we have a large number of foreign students. We have about 205 uh, foreign students. And also another large group of students uh, absorbed from the, the previous site of medical faculty under a special provision act. Currently, our student sent is... Uh, uh, Dr. Namal, uh, can, you, uh, can I interrupt you for a moment? Uh, uh, your voice is a little bit low. Can you uh, speak a little bit loud? Then uh, we can hear you. Yeah, I, yeah, I can speak a bit louder. Currently, yeah. the, the total uh, student strength is uh, uh, 1,000. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. sir. Yeah, okay. 1,240. Uh, that includes uh, uh, 270 cadets, uh, 200 foreign students, and, and 750 students uh, absorbed from the site. And also our training. Uh, the cadets also un have to undergo military training. That also we have to consider when we organize their uh, training program. Uh, so when we deal with these large number of students uh, and organizing academic activities and clinical training for them, we have to have a special uh, plan. Uh, the other uh, difference is that, uh, you know, um, because of these large numbers, uh, we have to send our students to so many different hospitals uh, in small groups. Uh, at the moment, uh, we are uh, sending our students to 17 different places for clinical training. 
I am not going to list all the all the hostels that they go uh, in the interest of time. But uh, starting with the, the University Hostel KDU uh, and several hostels uh, uh, in the Health Ministry are given for the training of these students. The other uh, difference is that the students of the KDU are not uh, doing the common exams with the other medical students. And also, they are not going in the common merit list. So, when we plan our exams, we don't have to follow. However, although we are a non-UGC uh, medical faculty, we are closely following uh, the decisions uh, made by the, the standing committee of the, the medical faculty, uh, as well as the, the programs they run. Uh, we, uh, we work we learn from them and we, we also want to follow them. Uh, therefore, we, we uh, follow closely uh, about what the other medical faculties do. So, with that, uh, I, next I will move on to the online teaching, which I'm not going to talk much because all the other fellow deans have described it uh, I think adequately. And we also, from the first day, uh, um, the lockdown was started. We also followed uh, the online teaching. All the subjects in the in the uh, curricula uh, were done by the by the online platform. Um, only thing is that you know, although we have uh, completed most of it, uh, my little worry is that the other things like uh, the, the practical and uh, some of the, uh, the practical demonstration have been done. But uh, giving skills to the, uh, the students, like, you know, even uh, in the pre and para clinical uh, departments, and as well as in the clinical departments, the skill component and uh, they are, uh, the development, uh, like uh, one of our colleagues mentioned about the extracurricular activities and uh, the other peer uh, discussions, uh, as well as even uh, uh, like development of the attitude, those can't be done. Uh, in the online platform, so, so we have to think about it when we plan uh, these programs in the future. However, the, the online programs are done successfully. Uh, but at this juncture, I want to thank the academic staff and the non-academic staff as well as the medical students because they all understood the situation and uh, they were agreeing to cope up or adapt with the situation uh, and uh, without their help, we wouldn't have done what we have done. In, uh, not only in KDU and also in the elementary faculty. What we did was while uh, going on with the uh, online programs, we all, we first organized uh, to have our exams. Uh, so we knew that uh, uh, the UGC medical faculties, uh, were, the other medical faculties were planning to have the final exams uh, this month. So we also planned uh, to have our exams final exam this month, we actually did it. Um, we did the final examination theory component from 1st of June to the 6th of June. It was a, a, a challenge uh, because we had uh, 240 students doing the exam. Uh, so, uh, and also this was during the period that the curfew was lifting and again imposing. Uh, and after we planned the the exam, uh, as you know, on post, uh, the island wide curfew was imposed again. Uh, that was on an examination day. So we had to take special precautions in organizing the exam as well as uh, uh, taking uh, safety precautions. So, safety precautions wise, as uh, you know, one um, uh, dean also suggested, we had to. Uh, Check the temperature at entrance, uh, get them to wash hand, and also we send them a questionnaire asking whether they have had any contact history, whether they are having any uh, any symptoms suggestive of a, a disease condition, uh, and also the holes were arranged uh, at least two meters apart. Because usually an exam is held anyway, so one meter apart, but here is two meters, and that was not difficult because uh, the exam. Uh, the, the whole the exam holes in the university was available for us and the other students were not coming uh, and also we had isolated 
about five or six rooms. Yes, if any one of them were having uh, symptoms or, or suspicions, where we had two students who were who had just completed the quarantine period, so uh, they were kept uh, there. And even the same, uh, the staff, the invigilators and the boys were given uh, personal protective equipment uh, to you know uh, to work there. So likewise, but uh, actually we had uh, successfully held the examination. Out of 240, only two students were absent. Uh, we still don't know the reason for it, and, uh, but others were there. One small uh, uh, issue was that we had a lot of uh, foreign students, as I told you before. And uh, some students were in Bhutan. They could not come, and even if, if they came, uh, they had to undergo the quarantine period. So we had uh, uh, online meetings with them, and we all came to a, a decision that uh, they will sit uh, in the supplement exam as their first chapter. Uh, so, and and also to organize this, uh, we had to organize. I mean, if the uh, people needed any uh, lodging, we organized that. And we had a few buses coming from different places uh, to give them uh, transport. And also, we initially asked them whether they need any meals. So all those uh, uh, problems that uh, mentioned, we actually practically faced, and we they were they were given packeted uh, meals, and uh, all those were arranged, and we held it successful. And now they are going to have their clinical exam. Starting from 7th of July, uh, the difference is that usually we examine about 24 students per subject. Uh, clinicians are here, some of the dean, they all know. But here we are going to have only 16 students, examine only 16 students per day. So the exam will be uh, held over a long period of time. Uh, however, we are, we are planning to do that. And as a result, we also had to uh, allow them to go to the board. So these students have had not gone to work since February. So now, uh, unofficially, because it's not official clinical training for them, because they have to uh, practice for their clinical examination, they are, go they are going. Uh, so what we have done is to allow up to 10 students to go at a time. We have divided the ward into three shifts from 8 to 12, 1 to 5, and 6 to 10, and four wards uh, in four. So we can, we can easily do that. And we monitor that whether whether it happens, and also we at the moment we are using both uh, University Hospital KDU and Neville Fund Hospital for this purpose. So that is uh, with the final exam. But we also have planned to uh, do the second MBBS exam starting from 24th of August, and uh, next month we are going to do the part one exam, uh, third MBBS part one, and in September uh, the the third MBBS part two, and uh, in October. The supplementary exam of the final year. Uh, and with regards to the clinical training program, uh, we are actually following what happens in, in other medical faculties as well as how the authorization is given by the, uh, the health ministry uh, with regards to sending students to the health ministry hospital for clinical training. Uh, that uh, we are following uh, for the for next professorial, for the next batch. We will not be able to start until the beginning of August because this exam that we are conducting is finishing. Uh, so the hospitals will be out of bound, the University of KD and the Neville Fund Hospital will be out of bound for hospitals, so we will not be able to. But the other clinical training uh, commencement will be depending on the authorization given by the health ministry and the other relevant authorities for the uh, clinical training. Uh, now, in the future, uh, we will have to change a, a little bit uh, because uh, when the students go, as uh, mentioned before, the student numbers have to be uh, smaller and also the ward situation, uh, the facilities have to be changed because as you know, most of the wards in the health hospitals are overcrowded and uh, there are a lot of staff, uh, the bystanders, the patients, and the staff members, they all are uh, working in a very uh, small environment, uh, and when students also go there, they, they further increase the, the density inside the ward. Therefore, the separate places for them to have work classes and all these things need to be arranged. And also, uh, the skills lab uh, and a simulation center is very important. In KDU, we have a, an excellent skills lab, 
and we have sim men uh, we can program them uh, to give different clinical scenarios we can use them for clinical training and simulation can be done when one uh, person examines a uh, person a patient others can watch so likewise there are a lot of uh, uh, different uh, ways of conducting clinical te teaching we also uh, we are also looking at them and also we are plan prepared to learn from what uh, other medical faculties do having said that as you, as i told you at the beginning there are a lot of uh, students like uh, at the moment we have uh, 823 students uh, needing clinical training once the university is started again but we are looking into it and uh, because we have done this before also uh, to these large numbers of students and uh, we will do it the best possible way uh, possible uh, but taking all the precautions for the safety of students and last thing uh, as uh, we discussed uh, this is also a good opportunity uh, for the students to uh, go for clinical training and do their training in a different uh, situation because they can learn then how to take these precautions how to wear these protective equipment and how to be um, you know uh, have uh, take take safety precautions and do their clinical activities when they become doctors they can use those skills that they acquire during the training okay i will not uh, talk to talk any further because uh, time is up and uh, i can answer any questions if you want thank you very much again Thank you, Professor Nawal Vijay Singh, and uh, thank you for highlighting uh, how you are going to arrange the clinical examination because that would be another challenge that we'll be facing. Because of the interest of time, we'll be moving into the next presentation. After that, we'll be making few comments again from the deans. And the next presentation is from uh, Professor K. D. Patirana, who is a professor in medicine. Uh, is representing the Faculty of Medicine, University of Rohan. Yeah. Good afternoon. Thank you, uh, Indika and Sajid. Uh, i am representing uh, the dean faculty of medicine who is in a different meeting today um first of all i would tell what we did during this uh, when the epidemic is uh, on and the uh, and the country is closed down um i asked the um, mnsu head i spoke to the dean and uh, discussed this of course he agreed and then uh, the next question asked by the uh, most of the staff members was whether we are giving equal opportunities opportunities to for the all the students uh, well while uh, doing uh, we used the lms and uh, uploaded our lectures and uh, then of course we some of us have already started uh, zoom lectures in the meantime we quickly surveyed the, through the batch steps we surveyed the availability and accessibility of the technology for the students and uh, actually it was very good then there were only about four students who four or five students who did not have a smartphone unfortunately but um, i have seen uh, many have suggested uh, how to support the students in fact uh, trade union uh, rfmta uh, volunteer to uh, supply smartphone for those who did not have smartphones regarding the accessibility uh, the dean spoke to the service providers but still there were two or three students who did not have a uh, good online access but uh, then we recorded the uh, the zoom lectures and uh, uploaded them into the uh, lms so what we have done there is um, roughly the same like uh, most of the other, what most of the other faculties have done and in addition to lectures we uh, conducted some uh, small group discussions to uh, break out rooms and there was a very good access uh, acceptability by the students and uh, in fact uh, regarding the lectures the attendance was very good uh, many have uh, many were online uh, of course there were some technical problems again where students could not be they were in the waiting room but uh, more or less their their participation was very good and the number of questions asked uh, all of the uh, teachers have said 
the number of questions i've asked uh, is much more than in a normal lecture um well there is a plus and a minus point of it uh, because uh, it is because they are sort of uh, they are suppressed or they are little reluctant to ask questions in a lecture where the others are there so that indicates another aspect because online lectures alone may not be adequate to improve their other skills and that we are planning to address and uh, clinical departments did many case based discussions problem based discussions where are again uh, the other advantages when we are doing a group discussion with the batch generally only one group maybe maximum 20 to 40 students may be joining the the normal class but here uh, virtually the full batch can join in the group discussion or the case based discussion so that we felt as an advantage and we used uh, e library and we always uh, send them the link for the textbooks um, uh, to be read with the pages uh, many many have uh, received the link but uh, only few have uh, were ready when we tested that uh, the other aspect is uh, once we have started zoom lectures the the other teachers who are not really in the faculty but uh, extended faculty teachers have started zoom uh, from their private links so that at about 100 students directly joined and to various other means uh, most of the students joined especially they were discussing uh, questions uh, um, and uh, difficult scenarios and the uh, mcqs and so forth uh, luckily we had a fairly good infrastructure although that was not uh, sufficient at times especially the internet speeds um, so other important thing that we have noticed is earlier when we were introducing lms like some as somebody some rails also mentioned people were a bit reluctant they were think of copyrights uh, the lectures will be copied and, uh, and many concerns uh, when we at the asked them to uh, upload their lectures into the lms but soon after this problem occurs everybody nearly everybody agreed that uh, this is a very good way and this need to be continued uh of course uh, there are many ways that the teachers join uh, the zoom uh, or the zoom lectures because sometimes at times when there are many lectures going on in the faculty uh, some teachers has to go back to home and uh, start lectures but subsequently they were all sorted out and we have planned to upgrade the system so that uh, we can do them from the faculty Uh, regarding the number of lectures to go and as i said the con for content delivery zoom is a very good platform and even for discussions um, uh, the case based discussions small group discussions uh, many things can be done but there is as uh, we have found in this uh, lectures they when they ask more questions during the uh, online lectures than one to one lecture so what we felt is that those skills the skills of communication skills of uh, team working leadership those things cannot be done through zoom so i think part of the lecture we felt that uh, uh, what proportion it should be online and what proportion it should be real was discussed and uh, there is no consensus but uh, we thought it should never be more than 50% but some people said it's 30% but uh, should never be more than 50% and uh, uh, we again uh, felt that the students there should be a way to check the uh, whether the students can just be online and do nothing and uh, uh, being a father of three children i know sometimes what they do with online lectures so Uh, what we felt is that at each lecture as again somebody mentioned that it's better to give some formative assessment i the mcqs or discussion to answer and we always give our uh, official email address to them and they uh, send us answers and again we have done many surveys of their uh, 
participation as well as the uh, evaluation of the lectures. Uh, so there is a very good feedback. Uh, there are again the, there are several concerns. Uh, many, although many students said this is a good platform, uh, one or two has said, uh, especially during these small group uh, breakthrough uh, rooms, uh, they said some students dominate. But we were and and that uh, to go back to sort of a lecture type of a teaching. But when we checked the authenticity of these uh, email addresses, we found that they were not really coming from the students. So I don't know what has happened there. One or two has said uh, the small group discussions uh, uh, are dominated by one or two participants, which I have not noticed myself. And of course, uh, you can go into the online discussion room and see what uh, they are discussing. Most of the time they are discussing the stuff or, okay, or with occasional deviations. Uh, teachers have been very positive, but one or two departments felt that, uh, again, because of the concerns regarding the uh, equal opportunities thing, they will only use the LMS platform. Regarding the clinical teaching, and we all agreed, most of us agreed that although we can have some case discussions, clinical teaching per se cannot be done through this media. And uh, we have discussed in our departments to some extent, how we are going to do this when uh, the country reopens. Probably we will not entertain the same number of students in the ward. We will be maybe dividing them into three or four and uh, doing different activities rather than all gathering uh, at the same place. And we are trying to use the morning and afternoon sessions for the final year batch because they have finished all their lectures. So they are free uh, throughout the day. So we will be have having two sessions uh, with half number of students as one suggestion. And the discussions probably be done at a different place uh, than the hospital. Probably they may be taking the history and discussing in a larger uh, teaching area in the, in the faculty. So uh, those are the things. And as all the other faculties, we also have, um, plan we are planning to conduct the final examination, the theory. And the clinical suffers, luckily we have completed it uh, before theory. So that uh, that problem may not be for us. And even in that case, what we were planning is, again, uh, as um, uh, the, uh, the Dean Kedu mentioned, to have smaller numbers per day, uh, of course, making it a long uh, examination in case uh, COVID problem persists uh, till, till the next exam. because. Currently, we have finished our clinicals. Uh, so all the other measures like hand washing and uh, social distancing, we have followed and then we have um, all, all following the, uh, the government instructions. So uh, finally, I must say that although these are very good platform, uh, the, the equal opportunity status should be respected. Then as many have mentioned here, we have to have some system where the, all the students have the access, not only for the LMS, but for the Zoom lecture as well, online, direct. And uh, when we have to have new ways of doing practicals, clinicals we mentioned, but the other important aspects like uh, communication and interpersonal skills and leadership skills, uh, that type of things, I think we still need to uh, have uh, the traditional, either traditional way or small group with some uh, social distancing and in a in a in teamwork and interpersonal skills i don't know how to maintain the uh, the social distancing and having effective training right okay thank you very much and thank you professor kitsiri patirana and now uh, we have heard from all the faculties and it's really wonderful to listen to what the faculties have taken under these very challenging circumstances and the wonderful work that they have been doing. And there are a lot of commonalities that all the faculties have taken up this challenge and a lot of innovative activities have taken place. And uh, they have discussed how the faculty has taken up this challenge and the students and how they have uh, faced it positively and enjoyed the teaching and the learning. That was a very positive kind of outcome. And then the 
challenges really related to the facilities, resources, and also ensuring equity, how to provide the facilities for everyone, and the challenges related to clinical teaching, assessment. So many areas are discussed. Maybe uh, before concluding, we'll uh, go through one round with our resource persons with uh, one short comment related to those areas that we have discussed. We can, uh, you can come in any sequence, whoever who want to come first, and maybe with one short comment related to the areas that we have discussed previously. And uh, we don't have much time remaining. Anyhow, if, any, if there are any other burning questions, you can raise your hands and we might be able to give the opportunity. Shall we go another round with our panelists? Before concluding, any of the panelists can come. I think may I start then? <laughs> yeah. So uh, I think as I said at the beginning, uh, I think all of us are in this together and uh, we are all facing the same challenges, the same issues and um, there is an opportunity for all of us to learn from each other and um, doing that collaboratively, going forward collaboratively, I think is the way to, um, uh, way to success. So I, um, as I said at the very beginning, um, um, we uh, look forward to collaborating with everyone. And I hope um, as we go along, uh, we will also be able to take um, our, um, our uh, standard of our medical education uh, to a different level. And also this will be the opportunity for us to integrate technology um, both educational technology as well as other technologies uh, into our medical school. So we should uh, uh, make use of this opportunity. So that's my concluding remark. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, yeah, so what about the other panelists? You can come out with very short comments based on. Yes, uh, Sasha Indika, can I come in? Yes, please. Yeah. No, I think uh, up to now uh, in Sri Lanka, our state medical faculties have been training very skillful uh, doctors who are very good in their clinical uh, skills. So I think our main challenge is the theory and to some uh, extent the uh, paraclinical uh, practical and things. Maybe uh, this is a very good, uh, the web-based uh, web uh, mode is very good. But I think our challenge is to really think of how we are going to maintain the clinical skills and the good attitudes uh, among our medical students in clinical uh, teaching. Because finally, as a house officer, they should be very skillful in treating patients. Human, the empathy, all those things, I think we have to pay real attention in training the students in those modes. So, with that uh, concluding remark, I, mean, I, I think I, I would like to uh, make, uh, as the medical educators, we, we all, the deans, I think we have to uh, pay extreme attention in how we are going to maintain the clinical skills training for the students. Thank you. Thank you. And I think that's very important because the minimum standards also come into play. So how we can reach those minimum standards within the current constraints, but without compromising on the clinical training. So that would be the main challenge that we are having. Yes. And uh, shall we move into the other panelists that we are having? Dr. Angela, you want to come? In, uh, or Dr. Taman? Uh, yes, come. Yeah. First of all, I must thank uh, you, uh, Prof. Indika. Uh, for organizing this very important meeting, uh, because it's very really, uh, good uh, for all of us to uh, discuss uh, this important matter. Uh, I think uh, after listening to everyone, uh, the teaching in the pre clinical and the paraclinical subjects are going on uh, relatively smoothly, although the practicals and those sort of things need to be uh, uh, done uh, <coughs> further. However, uh, the clinical training uh, is the area that we have to uh, put a lot of uh, attention into. Uh, I also believe as a clinician that uh, the most important component of the, the academic program of a medical student is the clinical training. And uh, in a country like this, uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, clinical material. We have to make use of them. And 
uh, improve the skills, uh, clinical skills of our students and make them good house officers and, and, and good doctors. So uh, uh, we have find different ways in this new uh, normal uh, scenario uh, to do this. One small uh, suggestion is uh, to you know go away from uh, old, uh, try and go away from the traditional uh, teaching uh, hospital to peripheral hospitals also where they are good material and also uh, good clinician uh, now uh, all the peripheral hospitals have board certified consultants so uh, make use of them and send small groups of students uh, to their <coughs> clinical training thank you very much thank you thank you dr Raman. uh yes uh, i think uh, again you highlighted the need for clinical training and making the maximizing the uses of resources available probably the role of technology is to uh, identify how to deliver and not to compromise the clinical material that is available to us i think uh, dr asri abegnuar then he has to leave early but he also want to convey the same message using the technology uh, to deliver the clinical teaching without compromising uh, then the other panelist your final comments well i'm professor nirmali vikramaratna uh, I like to take this opportunity to tell that uh, uh, with this experience that we are having today, uh, going online teaching, and the, uh, this we can take as opportunity, and uh, uh, now we can actually, uh, I mean, by facilitating the online teaching, we can get the expertise knowledge from other universities, well-established universities, professors, uh, to address the areas that we do tough. So there are areas that we cannot uh, find uh, professors in those particular fields. So if we can get the expertise knowledge from those. Uh, so here we can, from the beginning, start addressing the, uh, maintaining the standards of the medical education. And, yes, uh, I would like to add uh, Professor Indika uh, that this is a good opportunity to develop the self-directed learning in students. So they must, our staff also must be guided how to guide the students in self-directed learning and um, about using the peripheral hospitals also. Yeah, uh, so even though we, they are very good clinicians, I think time to time we have to update their knowledge in clinical training, how to deal with the students and what need to be said to them. Right? Sometimes they go out and they come with the students are uh, not treated well or they are looked down upon so therefore i think uh, the uh, sort, of, sort of a training or a um, capacity building for all clinicians to be done uh, should be done time to time regarding medical students teaching uh, thank you madam uh, dr patirana yeah uh, ma what why i want to stress is although this is a very good platform and we can do content teaching here but we should never forget that major part of our training is uh, in clinical training and uh, not only the clinical examination and the cases but the other soft skills so i think as soon as this is uh, this has come to normalcy now we are in a no, uh, new normal but when we come to normalcy we should well, while continuing the good aspect of this we should uh, restart our teaching uh, with the students clinical teaching and the the classroom teaching because that gives the different other aspects of uh, teaching learning and especially uh, there is a hidden curriculum like like in a small group discussion the students will learn many other things other than what's stipulated in the curriculum so my uh, my request is to well not completely forget uh, the good aspect of the traditional teaching uh, when we restart Thank you, sir. Any other comments by Dr. Pilapitiya or Dr. Bhuvatta? Yeah, Dr. I will also agree with the majority and what I want to also say the strength of our graduates in this country is the clinical training. And so far, whatever the modalities we have used in online platform do not replace any of the, uh, you know, they do not reach the same level of the kind of clinical training we offer and the skills and the soft skills that the students acquire. So by no means this will be a replacement for that. But I would like to join with the Dean of Colombo Medical Faculty who initially in his speech said we should advance and you know, incorporate the technology for uh, more advanced things where we might be able to reach some or you know, 
uh, to use them for uh, in place of the clinical training to a certain limit, but not never in total. So we have to be very careful and uh, venture very uh, carefully in this region to make sure that our graduates will never be deprived of the kind of clinical training they were receiving. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Bovatha or Professor Asiri, any other final comments? Professor Vijay Singh? Since uh, there are no uh, other comments, I would like to hand over uh, to Professor Indika uh, to carry on the session. Thank you, Sajit. And uh, with that, we come to the end of this very useful, very productive session. And I think I would say a historic session. And uh, we are all the deans coming together and sharing the experiences of this new situation and how to move towards the new norm. And we have listened to all this inform important information, we share the information. And let's move from here onwards, identify what are the areas that we need to move. And uh, then the way forward, this uh, session will be available online uh, for all of you to share and will be summarized in the findings and then conveyed to the necessary decision makers, including the Ministry of Higher Education as well as the UGC and all the faculties so that we can make use of the, of the discussion, this very valuable and important discussion. With that, I thank all of you, everyone who supported to organize this first pre-conference workshop, our technical team from SLMA, including Pamod and Sajit and everyone from SLMA and all the deans who in spite of their very busy schedules who spent very valuable time with all of us and sharing valuable information which we cannot get from anywhere else. So thank you for all of you and our participants, the academics and the lecturers and all other participants. Thank you very much for remaining with us and have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you.